those of you that don't know me, my name is Shola McIntyre. Um, I'm an attorney in the Colorado Springs Public Defender's Office, and I've been an attorney for 30 years as a public defender, doing nothing but criminal defense. I am teaching my very first semester this uh, spring in a violence in society. Um, I love my class, you didn't know it. And we are about to cover the chapter, chapter on intimate violence or domestic violence, and I thought what better way than to do a campus event and to allow the rest of the school to spend some time with some of my favorite people. Um, as part of my job in the Public Defender's Office, I run problem solving courts, which means I oversee most of the four judicial problem solving courts, and one of the ones that I'm an active member on is the domestic violence team. And so I ask the domestic violence team to come and be a part of this because they are the ones that know this topic much better than I do because I only see it from one side and that's from the trial side of all of this. So with me tonight is Sergeant Larry Morgan of the Colorado Springs Police Department, Courtney Sutton, so Sutton um, who used to be with Tessa, um, is now at the 4th Judicial District Attorney's Office in the Victim Advocacy Program, but going back to Tessa, and then the Honorable Doug Miles. A little bit about all of these people. Um, the Honorable Doug Miles is a graduate of the University of Colorado Law School. Um, once graduating from law school, he was in the District Attorney's, the 4th Judicial District Attorney's Office for well over 20 years. Am about right on that, Judge? 23. 23 years. He was then appointed to the county court bench, and he was appointed in 2011. Uh, 2010. 2010. Knew there was a year gap. <laughs> he and I actually went up to the governor at the same time, um, both of our names for consideration to be judges. Judge Miles got it. I, of course, didn't, <laughs> which was a blessing in disguise. Um, Judge Miles, though, um, oversees a normal county court docket, but then he also started the first problem-solving court on domestic violence, and I think we're one of the only courts in the entire state of Colorado. And as we talk today, you're going to hear this is a really difficult population to deal with in a problem-solving court because there are so many different issues that they're dealing with. And that's what makes it unique and makes it a difficult population for us to have many successes. And if any of you have worked much in domestic violence, you know that that's true of perpetrators, that they're a hard population to deal with. Um, Courtney, um, as I indicated, uh, came. To, uh, I got to know Courtney through her responsibilities through TESA. Um, she is a victim advocate. Courtney is a graduate um, of a master's program here at UCCS. And she got her bachelor's degree from Tennessee. Not sure if she's from Tennessee, yep. but that's, she's from Tennessee. Um, Courtney has a very unique perspective, and she's taught me a lot in the time that we've been together working on the domestic violence team because I never have to think about victims and victim rights. Um, I'm more focused on the rights and the constitutional protections of the defendant. So she's really opened up my mind about having to look at the world from her perspective and understanding all of that, and I really appreciate it. And then finally, um, Larry Morgan is with the Colorado Springs Police Department. And I do have your, it's quite long. He's been with the Colorado Springs Police Department since 1985. He was promoted to the rank of sergeant in 1999, currently the second highest tenured sergeant. He's the uh, department's liaison to the 4th Judicial D um, District's Domestic Violence Problem Solving Court. He's been trained as a domestic violence subject matter expert. Um, I serve as a wound interpretation crime scene management specialist, graduate of the International Association of Chiefs of Police Leadership and Police Organization class, completed lots of certifications. Um, Larry and I had a love-hate relationship in the beginning. We probably still in his mind have a love-hate relationship. But I think that we've learned a lot from each other. Um, I respect him immensely. I respect anything he ever has to say. Um, he obviously, again, looks at things from a law enforcement perspective, and I don't ever have to do that. So I'm really honored to have all three of these people here today to be a part of all of this. I have a few things that of interest. 
In 2014, 16,700 people reported one or more domestic violence crime to the Colorado law enforcement. 25 Coloradoans were killed by former or current intimate partners in 2014. Almost 70% of those were killed with guns. In 2014, 1,018 people were abducted by a current or former intimate partner. 325,000 Coloradoans are stalked during their lifetime. One in three women and one in four women in the United States have experienced some form of physical violence by an intimate partner. On a typical day, domestic violent hotlines receive approximately 21,000 calls, an average of close to 15 calls every minute. Intimate partner violence accounts for 15% of all violent crimes. The presence of a gun in the home during a domestic violence incident increases the risk of homicide by 500%. 72% of all murder-suicides involve an intimate partner 94% of the victims of these crimes are female. It's a topic that we need to talk about, and I'm glad to see so many people showed up tonight to spend some time with us over the next couple of hours talking about domestic violence or intimate partner violence. Thank you. Uh, why don't you go first, Okay. Well, the thing that you have to sort of really understand for us is that um, Domestic violence is not a game. Uh, how we look at it and how we train our young officers to handle and manage domestic violence investigations is simple. It's homicide prevention, period. That's the first thing that we teach our cops is that domestic violence investigations, how we look into them, how we evaluate who gets arrested, who doesn't get arrested, how we evaluate injuries, uh, evidence, information that we receive from victims, suspects, outcry witnesses, neighbors. There are a lot of things that lead us to ultimately make an arrest or not make an arrest or simply document the events that occurred. You have to keep in mind that we're busy. We're extremely busy. We have lots of things to do. We never have time to just go door to door looking for problems and issues. We come when we get called. Now, unlike the fire department, it's different for us. We're not there to make everybody better. We're not there to hand out band-aids. We're not there to, it's like, it's not Burger King. It's, you can't always have it your way. It's plain and simple. Now, and, 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 the, and the truth of the matter is this. Uh, typically, when we get called, something happened. Most of the calls that we get, and I'll just give you one year, in 2015, we received, as a matter of fact, let's just take a guess. Somebody just give me a guess as to how many calls that were tabulated as domestic violence came into the city of Colorado Springs, a city of roughly 400,000 people. Just anyone take a guess how many calls were queued in and officers were responding as it relates to domestic violence. Just take a guess how many calls in one year. 40,000. One guess. Anyone else? Fifty thousand. Okay. Anyone else? Hundred thousand. Right around fifteen thousand. Okay. So forty-one times every day, round about every day, forty-one times, we get called to go to someone's house because someone has been the victim or the alleged victim of domestic violence. Uh, now, granted, the math of that uh, shows that fifteen percent of the time, only fifteen percent of the time, do we get there and establish what we determined to be probable cause to make an arrest. So oftentimes we're going to go, we're going to get there, and the cops are going to determine, based on all the information and evidence that we've obtained, is that something may be happened, but we don't have enough to make an arrest. Now, now keep in mind, like I mentioned, for me, as a field supervisor, I don't get to go to a lot of calls. It's kind of cool being the tenured dude, I get to go to the calls the count, the, the cool ones. And the ones that I just randomly go to or if I'm really close to where a call is, if one of the cops calls me, uh, if it sounds like there's liability on behalf of the city, or if it's a repeat call for service location. I can show you data where we have been sent to certain houses 25 times as it relates to calls from domestic disturbances. From one location, one house, 
25 times we've been there. And that should shock and surprise you that that would happen, but it's commonplace. Now, granted, when we go, we try to sift through all the information that we get. And I'll just be honest and I'll be candid with you, you guys are all grown ups. It makes it easier for us when we get there and somebody's injured. When someone's bleeding, or has been stabbed, or has been shot, it makes it easy for us. Now, I'm not minimizing that because it happens. We all know that it happens. It makes it easier when we find injuries because it's then really easy to go, okay, you're injured, you're not, you did it, you get to go to jail. But that's not always the case. Oftentimes people injure other people in an attempt to prevent themselves from getting injured. I see him, he's gonna hurt me, he's gonna punch me. He's taking his rings off because when he hits me and he's got rings on, he knows that that's gonna leave a mark. So I strike out first. I'm in the kitchen, I'm cooking. I'm not cooking fast enough. What I'm making is not good enough. I don't get it on the table and it's not hot enough. And now he's yelling at me and he's coming at me. I throw a skillet of hot grease on him. Happens, been there, seen that. Can victims in those instances at times articulate to us a legal defense of self-defense? Had I not done that, I would be the one with a knife sticking out of my neck. And I've been there. I've been to calls where I've seen someone with a knife sticking out of their necks. I've been to domestics where people have been killed, murdered, stashed in basements, stashed in trunks, in this town. Okay? We have domestic violence, homicides in this town, often. Okay? So keep in mind, the forms that I've given you is it, as it relates to uh, the handouts, duties of peace officers and prosecuting agencies, those lists are no joke. And if you read those lists, and I'll be honest with you again, if you read the news, cops oftentimes get fired for excessive force, shooting someone when they shouldn't, beating someone up when they shouldn't. We, we don't have that problem here with the College Police, Police Department. In the time that I've been here, the 32 years and change that I've been here, uh, it's, it's just my, it's my knowledge that we've terminated three employees for excessive use of force. Three in 32 years. Like I said, every day we have contacts with people, strangers, people that we don't know, that may or may not possess weapons, that may or may not want to hurt us. We're going and taking a shot in the dark that we're always going to be safe and that's not always going to be the case. The duties that we have outlined to us with regards to domestic violence are no joke. This is a mandatory arrest state. If we go, we get there, we determine that there's probable cause to believe that someone committed a crime, we're gonna make that arrest and somebody goes to jail for three days, period. Okay. Now keep in mind, it takes a lot to get to that standard, but not much. Push, a shove. False imprisonment, you're not leaving, you're not going anywhere. We're gonna stay here and we're gonna finish this argument. That's a crime. Not letting someone leave a room or walk out of a room is false imprisonment. I get up, I try to leave, you don't let me. You go to jail for three days if the person that you're doing that with is an intimate partner. That's domestic violence. A push, a shove. And you see the statute there for harassment push, a shove, to otherwise annoy, to follow about in a, in, a, in a building. Those are all crimes of domestic violence. And for that, in this town, you go to jail, or in this county, or in this state. And keep this in mind, what, what I'm talking about as it relates to use of force. Three cops that I know of, three cops that I knew, were fired for abuse of force. I don't know of any that have been fired for not doing a good job on domestics, but I can tell you there have been a number that have been disciplined for missing signals, for missing cues, for not making arrests when they should have. Now the language that I'm about to use is the only language that I can use to make sense to you here. Unfortunately, in the 32 years that I've been here, and in the 18, 19 years that I've been a boss, I've been on the very front end of a number of chicken shit DUI arrests. 
where we've arrested people that where you would think that you wouldn't arrest someone for it. But as it relates to domestic violence, we partner with this community. We partner with the DA's office. We partner with Tessa. We partner with CASA. We partner with the judges and, and the DA's office and uh, the district attorney's office and along with the public defender's office. We have a partnership. Through that partnership, it has formed our policies and procedures on how we respond and how we work our way through domestic violence calls for service. And those partnerships uh, are obviously what leads us to make arrest or to not make arrest in certain cases. And, and, and trust me, cops have gotten days off, have been suspended from missing obvious signs or for missing this or missing that or for simply saying, I didn't think it was enough, so I didn't make an arrest. I go, I get that report, and I see what the officer has written. And to me, as an expert, go back, arrest somebody. I've done that countless times. Because once I sign that document at the bottom, and I say, OK, that's cool. What well, you did was great. That's fine. I'm good with it. It becomes my non-arrest. That's me, in essence, saying, cool, great, bonus, I'm good. Now, typically, I have to think about, like what I said to you, that repeat call for service. Those are the ones that are deadly. I automatically start to think. And some of the things that we go through as it relates to making arrest or not making arrest is, trust me, believe this when I say when the DA's office tells us, absent injuries, absent knife in the neck, we want you to believe our victims. If a victim calls and says, I'm the victim of domestic violence, I was pushed, I was shoved, I was kicked, I was otherwise annoyed, I was followed or whatever. Absent independent witnesses, oftentimes, we're going to take that victim's word and we're going to make an arrest. So what I have to caution you at, not to say that you folks are all out beating your, your partners up or doing whatever, allowing people to, okay, let's chill, let's, let's not talk about this, let's talk about this later, let's, let's put this off. That's a better way to go. Because trust me, it doesn't take much to get arrested for domestic violence for a lot of good reasons. And an arrest in that instance will change the complexity of your life. And I tell our young cops this all the time. When we're looking for injuries. Where are your injuries? Are they on your arms because you're going up here, protecting yourself from getting hit in your face? There's so many things that we look for. Who did you call? Who did you tell? Oh, no one, I was afraid. Where are your injuries? I don't have any injuries. You're too embarrassed to maybe let me see where your injuries are. He hits me on my butt. And I'm not going to take my pants off and show you bruises on my butt. That's what we deal with. And those are the unfun questions that we have to ask. Do you have any injuries that you wouldn't want to divulge or that you wouldn't want to show or that you wouldn't want us to take photos of? You know, we ask that question every day. So keep in mind, that ultimately it's a tough job, but we knew it when we signed on to do this job that it's not fun. Like I said, we're not the fire department, it's not always fun. It's tough getting there, pointing fingers and assessing blame. Who did this? Who gets arrested? Why are we here? Those are just some of the things that we go through. Uh, with regards to our numbers, they're, they're, they're disproportionate. Granted, out of all the domestics that we go to, who would guess, just someone give me a guess or shout out a number, what percentage of the people that we arrest would you believe would be women? Someone give me a number. <coughs> Take a guess. What percentage out of 100 would you think on average every year those offenders are women? Anyone have a guess? Nailed it. 25. 25%. Now, nationally, our number is high. Typically, uh, from a national standpoint, it's closer to 15. But, but here, uh, I think we're typically arresting the right person. We really are. Uh, you know, but, but it's unfortunate that people can't take the time to, to maybe stop, pause, reflect on what they're doing, reflect on what the relationship is. And that's the other sad piece of my job, is getting there and finding out who your crime victim is and who your suspect is and what their relationship is. And typically, it's the person that loves you most that's going to kill you. 
or the person that you love most that you're going to kill, or allegedly you love most, and you're going to kill. And trust me, like I said, we don't like going to domestics. It's part of what we do. Uh, it's, it's one of the most important calls that we go to because we can't afford to be wrong. If you're wrong and you walk away or if you miss something, you know, in the aftermath, awful things can happen. Like I said, it's really it's a tough deal for us. And trying to get it right is really what we try to do. And granted, like I said, we, we, we discipline cops for missing things. Uh, you know, if you're going to get fired as a cop, it's not going to be for abusive force. It's not going to be for missing something on a domestic. It's going to be typically for lying. Because we don't discipline cops that lie. We fire them. If you give false information or you don't report something accurately, we fire you. And we do that every year. Trust me. Just like any other business, we have people that underperform or that don't do as we ask or that don't follow policies and procedures, and we fire them. Just like everybody else, I'm sure that at McDonald's or wherever, people get fired every day when we fire cops for underperforming in lots of areas. You're more likely to lose your job for not doing a good job on a domestic. You're more likely to lose your job then than you are for using an abusive force or beating someone up. On top of that, you have to keep in mind, too, we also send lots of people to jail every night for resisting arrest. Every night in this town, we fight with people. That's why we have shirts that don't have buttons. Our shirts have zippers. Maybe you guys don't know that, but every night people fight with us, and we get in domestics, and typically those are entertained. So we wind up arresting a lot of people for that charge, and typically, you don't see it on the news because usually we did it right. And usually, and the judge can attest to this, six months after that arrest, we get a cool letter. Oh, sorry, officer, I fought with you. Sorry, I took a swing at you. You know, sorry, you know, you broke your knee or, or lost your, and that's happened. We've had cops that have gotten in injuries or in crashes or been fighting with people that have lost their careers and it happens. I can't count the, little, the letters that I have. I should have brought some of them out of thinking. The number of letters that I've gotten from people saying, sorry, I was drunk and crazy, made a bunch of horrible mistakes, and took a swing at a 275 pound <laughs> <laughs> Happens. Happens. Believe me, happens. Okay. Drugs, love, money. We always try to look for that connection when it comes to homicides, uh, anger. Those are the four. You know, you look at those four things, that's what allows us to ultimately solve crimes. And on domestics, it's always passion, it's always love. Uh, but that's sort of what we do as it relates to domestics. We try to get it right, we work really hard to get it right. Although it's hard, because imagine you have rights. I mean, you could potentially get arrested. It's really easy to go, <coughs> sorry cop, you're not going to talk. And you have the right to not talk. But that puts us in a horrible position because we have a victim that says, this is what happened to me. We have a potential suspect, whether it be male or female, that is not willing to give us information or to give us statements that could implicate them. And you can't blame them. You really can't. So we have to deal with what we have. A statement for someone from someone that we believe. There's a 911 call and the cops are here. Here's what happened to me. Injury or no injury, obviously, it's going to lead us to doing what it is that we do. 15% of the time, somebody goes to jail. And do we want to field questions at some point, or do we have to go and then do questions at the end? How about we go and then we'll do questions? Yeah, but I want to know, um, can you talk about how many repeat arrests of the same individual in domestic cases? Is it higher or lower about the same with yeah. any other crime? It's typically a little bit higher. Uh, recidivism as it relates to domestics, uh, it, just tend, it tends to be a little bit higher. The, oh, the cops came and I didn't get arrested, I got away with it. Or well, they didn't have enough. I've uh, got you. Uh, they're not taking me, there's not enough. You're not showing them where your marks are if they don't believe you. A lot of times they think, I just got over it. So I can continue to control you, I can continue to abuse you, I can continue to manipulate you, I can continue to torment you because I just got away with it. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. Especially on the repeat calls for service, and those are the ones that scare me. <coughs> We've been back time and time and time again. Those are the ones that haunt me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
So, so I just want to talk about kind of the victim's perspective of this and get to the root of what domestic violence is. So, has anyone heard of the power and control wheel? Okay, so you know at the center of it is power and control. And then you have all these pie pieces that are around it of all the different kinds of abuse. Abuse doesn't look like just a push, just a shove, a slap, strangulation. It looks like a lot of little tiny pieces of a pie that all come together for one victim and their offender. So whenever we're looking at that pie, you, the <laughs> offender starts with something small. They start with intimidating their victim and showing them, this is how big I am. I will be two inches from your face and I will be screaming at you and you can't do anything. And then the next day, they're minimizing and denying and blaming, it's your fault. You didn't have dinner ready. You didn't have the house clean. You know, this is the abusers. This cycle, this power and control is all rooted in the abuser. So you have a handout of the cycle of violence. And that explains for a lot of people how their week, their month is going to go. Everybody's cycle is completely different because it's all based on the offender, all based on that abuser. They control it. The victim acts within it. They can start that fight so they get it over with because they know once it's over, it's back to that honeymoon. It's back to that, I'm so sorry. It'll never happen again. I promise, I promise, I promise. I love you so much. We will be together forever. That's the honeymoon. They also have now started calling it the grooming stage, like a sexual abuse, where they start grooming their victim. And that's what they're doing. Because on the first date, they don't punch, they don't slap, they don't call them a name. It starts as Prince Charming. It starts as good times. And it develops and develops and develops. And some people move very quickly through that and can get to that strangulation. I've seen victims that were strangled a month or two weeks into their relationship. And that is the most lethal kind of abuse perpetrated by an abuser is strangulation. It's highly, highly dangerous for the victim. And once an abuser starts strangling their victim, most likely they'll continue doing it. And doing it again and again and again. And it's terrifying for that victim. And, you know, I hear Sergeant Morgan's numbers and I'm like, it doesn't even capture a piece of it. They are, victims are not reporting like we want, like we think that they should be, because it's scary. They love this person. This is their person. They've chosen this person, and they know that it can be good. That's the crazy thing. Things can be absolutely wonderful with this person, and then we're back to that explosion phase. You know, that's where we have victims staying. You'll hear this crazy question, why does she stay? Why does she stay? And I hope that if you ever encounter a victim, if, any, if you take anything from this talk, that is not the question that you'll ask. On average, it takes seven times to leave. Seven times. And it doesn't matter what's happened. But it takes seven times, on average. I've seen victims that, um, I was also um, an intern at Tessa where I provided therapy. I had a victim that would stay and leave and leave and stay and go back. I would say around 40 times in a year and a half. And that's just the time that I saw her. And 
that's normal. All of this is normal for these victims because they, are ch they will do anything to make it work, to figure out a way to make themselves more perfect, to do everything just right, to make the relationship work because that's the most important thing to them. They have children, they, maybe they aren't working so they don't have the self-esteem, the financials to actually be out on their own. There's so many reasons why people stay and we can never ask a victim and put that blame on them. They already feel that. They feel that blame every single day because their abuser is giving that to them and making them feel like this is their fault. But it's not. This is the abusers. All of this, all of their interactions of the intimidation, of the manipulation, of the denying the abuse, it's all theirs. It's all of the abusers. And the victim just acts within that cycle that you have. So they may start that fight just so they can end it and get back to that happiness. Um, so some other things that is also very common within the power and control is isolation. So the victim doesn't feel like they have anybody. You can't talk to that person. You can't be friends with them. And that is also rooted in jealousy. If I can't have you, no one will. And that's a very, very dangerous phrase to hear from somebody. Because if they leave, what's going to happen? The most dangerous time in a domestic violence relationship is when they leave. That is when people die. Or they're stopped. Or their abuser you know, finds them. Maybe they do false imprisonment of them. Let's just talk it out. We can make this work. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be fine. That is the most dangerous time for a victim. And they're also so isolated, where are they going to go? So then that pulls them back in to that relationship again. Some other pieces of that pie that we were talking about are using children. And that's something that happens a lot with domestic violence relationships whenever there is a child involved. You know, they make the other partner feel like they're the worst parent in the world. You can't do this by yourself. You can't take care of our child. You're a horrible parent. And makes that self-esteem smaller and smaller and smaller for the victim. The economic abuse is huge in these relationships. They don't allow the victim to work. Or if they do allow the victim to work, then they take their money. You can't have access to this. Or you get an allowance. I need to see every single receipt. I'll check your mileage. It's that complete control of another person's life. Something that you can't even fathom. You know, the things that I've heard while speaking to victims, and I've had approximately 2,000 victims in the years that I've worked with Tessa, and it's astounding what people do to this person that they say that they love. It is unfathomable what people do to each other and the pain that they will inflict to their partner. There's a lot of a lot of victims that are experiencing not only domestic violence in all of these pieces, but also they're being sexually assaulted by their partner and they're being stalked by their partner. They're being, you know, they have apps on their phone or on their computer to track every single contact that they have. Or whenever the victim is at work, they will text them hundreds of times. Who are you talking to? What are you doing? You know, just all of these 
constant communications because they can't let go. They can't allow the victim to have any control over any aspect of their life. And that is what the abuser is trying to gain throughout all of these tactics. And they will evolve and change once they see that their victim is growing and evolving themselves. So that's why we have that high, high danger level whenever there is, you know, someone leaving or they think that they're going to leave. And the power and control wheel is gendered. So the next piece of the puzzle is the male privilege. That can also be any type of other privilege um, that a person may have. But the, the typical um, with power and control wheel is the male privilege of this is my castle and you are my servant. Very gendered roles of you do this and I make the bacon. I bring home the bacon, you know? And then you have the actual coercion and threats of violence. And then on the outside of the wheel, you have the actual physical and sexual violence. So all of these pieces of the pie next to the power and control are non-violent. And only on the outside of it are the violent aspects of it. So there's so many different ways that abusers will manipulate and control their partner. I think so. <laughs> You'll get lots of questions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, so many areas I want to uh, kind of touch on. Um, let me, let me just start between making the tie between what Courtney said and, and the system, because <coughs> I feel, excuse me, I'm still fighting cold, but um, the court system is set up in a very specific way, and it's been that way ever since um, the creation of the country. Um, and certain basic principles have always been a part of our criminal justice system. Um, presumption of innocence, right to remain silent, you don't have to talk to the police. You can't tell the police lies, that's a crime. Uh, but you don't have to talk to them. Um, and one of the key components and, and uh, was developed 15 years ago, getting to another level, um, is um, the right to be confronted by the witnesses against you. Um, so we take these victims who have lived in these environments uh, where they have no power, um, where they are afraid most of the time. And by the way, that cycle that can happen in a week, it can happen in an hour. Um, because the use of violence is a tool. It's a tool to control someone. And if that tool needs to be used 20 minutes from when I use it last, because I think it's necessary, then it will be used again. Um, there typically is some remorse at some point, and that's, and that's gonna feed into something I wanna talk about in a minute. But, so you take these, these folks who are these primarily women, who are in these relationships that have been emotionally and psychologically disempowering, we then bring them into the court system. Um, you know, the arrest is made, police do everything right. Um, we bring them into the court system, and the court system says, your abuser has the right um, to be in the courtroom to watch you testify, um, and his attorney um, is going to cross-examine you and try and tear apart your story. Um, that's a difficult position for anyone to be in. I've been on the witness stand twice. It's miserable. Um, you have no power at all. Um, and so we, we expect these folks to somehow um, overcome all of that experience they've had, come into the courtroom, stand up to this person, um, and testify and Two things happen, uh, and this is one of my frustrations when I was a prosecutor. Um, either um, they minimize, recant, um, blame themselves. Recantation takes all kinds of different forms. I don't remember. It was my fault. I started it. Um, you know, I should have done X or Y differently. Um, and that, and. And that's their way of making themselves safe. It, it's basically the courtroom version of what the police see on the scene, which is the police get there, the person who was called hysterically and is 
clearly been traumatized and abused is now defending the abuser. And, I, and I've talked to officers who, they're just flabbergasted. Why, you know, why would she do that? And there's a very easy answer to that because, and, and the answer is because she's thinking about tomorrow already. She's way a steps ahead of you. You're there to deal with this particular incident. She's there to deal with this relationship and she's got to think down the road uh, because that's what self-preservation tells her she needs to do. We take that same, so she's doing that at, at the scene um, and in the courtroom she's minimizing, recanting, doing all the, those kinds of things or she may not show up at all. <coughs> um, the other thing I see is, is I do see what I referred to as a DA was the fed up victim who's almost, uh, well, in, in some ways, is a bigger problem. Because that's the victim who has had enough. She's done. Um, and she's going to get up there and she's going to come across that she's done. The first thing you have to be very careful as a prosecutor is to say, you only get to talk about this one night. I know this has been going on for the last 12 years, but, and that's a hard thing for people to do. You're telling them, take this small segment of your life and that's what we're going to focus on when you know that the context is much bigger than that. Um, so they have trouble not doing that and, and that can create huge problems because a person who's accused has the right to be tried on that charge that they've been accused on, not their whole history. The whole history may be important when it comes time for me to sentence that person, um, but in terms of the trial, it's very important. Um, and they come across as vindictive. Um, so you get, you know, it's either they're, they're, they come across as wishy-washy to the jury, and so the jury's like, well, they don't even seem to be that upset about it. They're minimizing everything. It didn't seem to be that bad. <laughs> so we're not, we can't say beyond a reasonable doubt it happened. Or, you know, this person clearly is just vindictive and trying to get back at this guy. And, and in my head as a prosecutor, I'm thinking, I, so what is the perfect victim? I mean, how do you, how do you present these victims in a way that's, that's convincing to a jury. And it's a real challenge. And the, and the area is challenging because it is so complicated. You know, Courtney and, and Sergeant have talked about their aspect of that. Um, from a court side of things, if I'm going to sentence someone, I have to keep in mind that everything I do has a collateral consequence on the victim. If I put the person in jail and they lose their job, they can't support the victim, they can't support the children who are probably still with the victim. Um, if I, um, it, it doesn't matter what I do, fines, jail, uh, even probation, those sorts of things, uh, everything I do to that defendant is going to have collateral consequences and that's what makes this area so, so complicated to find an, a, an effective way to respond as a system. <coughs> I am um, I didn't have any intention of getting into this area when I became a prosecutor. Um, but I had a case, it was a misdemeanor case. Um, it was a criminal mischief case, which means damage to property. Um, I, I knew nothing about domestic violence. I did not grow up in a family with domestic violence. I found out later that my grandfather was abusive to my grandmother and my father's way of dealing with what that, that was. We will never have arguments or controversy in, in his family. So I wasn't around it. Um, and this victim came in and said, here's the deal. Um, we were separated. He was actually an ex-officer. Ex um, he broke into my house. He stole all my left shoes. Um, took me like a day and a half to find them. They were up in the attic. Um, a little strange, right? Um, <laughs> But you can see the sort of the harassment aspect of it. I'm just, I'm just going to make your life miserable. Uh, the second time he broke in, he took the doorknobs off the, all the doors inside the house. Think about the symbolism there. Um, those were found in the crawl space. And she said, when he went in the backyard, turned on the hose, dropped it in the window well, and flooded my basement, I had enough. And that's why I'm here. And she said, Doug, and, and this was her quote. I've decided I have a choice. I can be a doormat or I can be a bitch. <laughs> and I've decided I'm going to be a bitch. Um, I went into standard bond in those cases, on those kinds of cases, was two, three hundred dollars. I went in 
As a prosecutor, I got the bonds raised to ten thousand dollars in each case. He bonded out the next day. Uh, went to a bondsman. Bonded out the next day. Went to her house. They were separated. Their original house that they had lived in was still vacant. They were separated. They had three kids. Two were in school. There was a little girl who was preschool age. She broke into the house. Um, took her at gunpoint and her and her daughter at gunpoint down to the basement, locked the daughter in a closet, uh, proceeded to sexually assault her, um, including with his pistol. Um, he then took her out of the house, left the kid locked in the, in the closet, drove her back to their original house and basically said, this is where our relationship started, this is where our relationship is going to end. Um, this woman was um, an, an amazing, an amazing survivor. Um, and she said, the whole time I was sitting there thinking, what am I gonna do? And she basically convinced him, she said, here's the deal. You walk me into that house at, at gunpoint, you know neighbors at this house, in this neighborhood are gonna see you, they're gonna call the police. So here's the deal, and he was a marksman, he was a, a, an incredible shot. You go in the house, um, you can see me from the front window. If I get out and try and run, I know you can shoot me. I'm not going to do that. Uh, you go in first, I'll follow you in in a few minutes. So he did. Um, she was sitting in the car trying to decide what the hell she was going to do. Uh, she heard a gunshot from inside the house and he committed suicide. Um, I had kept the, the, the DA at the time was John Southers. He actually talks about this story in his book. Um, and I had kept him up to speed. And so when I got that word, I went up to his office and walked in, and he looked at me and he said, which one died? Because um, he could just tell somebody had. And I realized at that point, I didn't have a clue what domestic violence was about. I had no idea what the dynamics were here, what, what the power structures were. <coughs> and so I tried to educate myself. Um, and what I found out is once you get involved in this area, you probably never will not be involved in this area um, because it just continues to be so challenging and complex. Um, we also figured out uh, there were a number of people in the, in the police department at Tessa and at the DA's office and we realized that what we were, our response wasn't being very effective. Uh, there are not that many convictions because of all the things that, that Courtney has talked about and, and the, the, how difficult it is to get up in court and testify against someone. Um, you know, we tried, we, we developed something called an enhanced response team that became known around the country and that involved, we, we didn't just send it off, uh, there was an officer who would respond and if that officer determined there was probable cause, he called a, a second team which included a prosecutor, a victim advocate, and a, and a sergeant. Um, and uh, um, we developed a, sort of a focus on, on folks. Uh, there's a thing that the police department can do called a BOLO, which is be on the lookout. Um, and so people who were selected to be, to, to focus down on, and these were a lot of the multiple offender guys, um, there, was, there was something put on the computer so that an, if an officer responded, they knew this was a person that we had eyes on. And we would go tell them. Uh, you know, we'd go meet with these uh, defendants either in, in the jail or in the courthouse and say, you're now a divert defendant, um, divert being domestic violence enhanced response team. And we wanted them to know. Because I think part of what we realized is we live in a society that is not as personal and connected as it was when I was a kid. I couldn't do anything in my neighborhood without one of the neighbors calling my folks and telling me. Um, now we don't even talk to our neighbors. These guys were anonymous. And so we decided we're going to make them unanonymous and we're going to tell them that they are. And we actually had guys, we'd say, You're, you are now in the divert program, you've been identified as a divert defendant, and he's got to go. Uh, no, I don't want to be, I don't want to be one of those, so um, can you take me off that list? <laughs> Not really your choice, but. Um, and so that was one way. Uh, the DV court is another way that um, we were trying to make a difference um, in how the system responds. <coughs> I think what we all really want is the violence to stop. Uh, and, and that's obviously for the safety of the victim, but it's also um, for the betterment of the defendant. And if we can somehow find a way, if the system can find a way to show defendants different ways to handle this, to change that behavior, um, then everybody's better off. 
Um, and so that was kind of the idea behind the, the uh, domestic violence court. Um, I had thought about this as a prosecutor, and then when I became a judge, I was able to actually do it. So uh, I called together a bunch of these folks uh, and said, you know, what do you think? Uh, and we started brainstorming and coming up. Everybody in the DV court is volunteered. They all have regular jobs, and they still come in every week. Um, for those of you that don't know about a problem-solving court, and I'm showing have you talked at all about the structure of problem-solving courts? I haven't judged. Okay. Um, problem-solving courts really approach these, these situations differently. First of all, they're specialty courts, so there's typically something in common for everybody in that court. Uh, the, the original ones were drug courts. Um, we now have a veterans court, we have the DV court, we have <coughs> um, family drug court, we have truancy court, we have all kinds of different specialty courts. Um, and the idea is that this is not going to be a regular um, probation. Uh, in, in my normal docket, I put people on probation every day. Uh, I give them a year or two years of probation. I send them to a probation officer. I will never see that person again if they do everything they're supposed to and don't get in trouble. I usually only see the people who screw up. Um, in, DV, in specialty courts, everybody is much more involved. And if someone comes into our DV court, they're in court once a week for, the, for their first phase. Um, they come in every single week and they meet with their probation officer and they meet with their treatment provider and we are in their business. Um, we are, and we tell them at upfront, this is not regular probation. So don't think you're gonna get the next six months to just kind of screw around before somebody actually calls you uh, on the carpet for what you're doing or not doing. We, we debated a long time about who to put in this court. I mean, on, on one side, you're thinking, well, if we could get the, the guys that are coming into the system brand new and, and really hit it hard, maybe we can deter that behavior that's not that habituated kind of behavior, although we also know that most people, when they come into court, that it's not the first time there's been a violent episode or something. It's just the first time the system has gotten involved. <laughs> so that was one idea, take the first time, kind of the low level guys, first timers and you know really focus down on them to change their behavior. Um, but we also knew that we'd see these guys coming back over and over and over again. Thank you. Um, it takes care of it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the other side was, why don't we take the worst of the worst? Uh, take the guys that are, I mean, I, I guess I can't say the worst of the worst because the worst of the worst go to prison. Um, but take those guys that are on their way to prison uh, and, and they're just a step away. So we decided ultimately that we'd start with those guys. Um, most everybody in our DB court has multiple cases. Uh, we take felonies and misdemeanors, if you don't know the difference. Misdemeanors are minor crimes, um, more minor crimes. Um, things like harassment, things like um, uh, false imprisonments, things like uh, simple assault, where there may be some injury, but it's not serious injury, not permanently disfiguring kind of injury. Uh, you know, the black eyes and the, and the bruises and all that stuff. Um, those are misdemeanors, we take those. We also take felonies, so we take um, menacing with a weapon. Um, and a lot of the guys we have in court have are facing revocation of their probation because they have not followed through. Um, so we decided we, that's where we would start. Um, and we brought in, um, we put the word out that those are the people we were looking for, and we got referrals from probation. Um, and, and then fairly quickly on, we started getting referrals from or request to look at cases from the public defender's office, from the DA's office, um, and we and we built our uh, population in DV court from that group. Um, I haven't we haven't done a, a because everybody's a volunteer. I don't really have a statistician, which I'd love to have. But the last time we re ran some numbers, um, about 50% of the people coming through the court were successful, which I got really depressed. Um, because it was only 50%. Um, and here we thought we had this great idea. Until somebody pointed out to me, Judge, we started out with 100% failure. So 
when you start out with 100% failure, 50% successes, that's not bad. Um, the bigger difference is that, okay, um, they help each other. Um, they, they're, they're all in court together. They're all in treatment together. They're, they all have the same probation officer. Um, and what we do see is um, a connection that these guys have started to create. These, these folks, in my experience, tend to be pretty much loners, isolated, um, unless they're going to unless they're in a DV group and uh, a kind of a standard uh, DV group. So this, for the first time, this uh, for a lot of these guys, they're actually uh, kind of having to deal with these issues in front of other men um, and and deal with their own issues. I did I. Um, I didn't have a, every so often I get a sort of reminder of this because it's like anything else, you get into a pattern and a routine and you're kind of trying to move these guys through. Um, and I was uh, telling Corey we had a situation uh, just on Tuesday where uh, we had a guy who was getting ready to graduate. Um, he had been through the program, he'd done all his DV counseling, uh, but he's a serious alcoholic. And that's another thing, that's part, another part of the complexity of these things. Most everyone in this, um, program has a substance problem of some kind. I will also say most everybody in this program comes out of a traumatic childhood. I mean, stuff you wouldn't even want to hear. Um, and so a lot of times the substance use is a, is a self-medication sort of a deal. Anyway, this guy had been struggling. Uh, he did his, finished his TV counseling. He's never reoffended, but he cannot stay sober. And it is a condition of our program that you not consume marijuana and alcohol or any illicit drug. Um, so we were having some people visiting from Albuquerque to see our program and see how it works. And um, so we decided we were gonna graduate this guy. And we do a ceremony, I give them a certificate, it's in a frame, and I make a big deal about that, because it is a big deal. Um, the guy comes up, gets his um, certificate. I think he's pretty emotional. He's sort of having trouble even talking. Um, we finish the graduation ceremony, I leave to go back and take the bench, you know, climb up on the bench and do my regular judge stuff. Um, and most of the team follows me back, I turn around, which is not usual, they don't really follow me out of the courtroom. Uh, and they say, we think he's drunk. And so we had him tested, he was a 0.41 blood alcohol. I don't know if you know what before, but legal limit is 0.08. Um, so that gives you an idea. Most people would be in a hospital uh, with alcohol poisoning at that level. This guy has has such a drinking habit that his liver is able to, he's able to function. So we have to take his certificate away from him. Um, and I have to put him in jail because we had to get him sobered up. So um, it, the, the, the reason I tell you that story is not because it's just another example of somebody who messed up, which he did. Um, it was the impact that that had on everybody else and every other defendant in the room. Uh, usually I, I try and keep it fairly light uh, when I call these guys to the podium. I, you know, my, my focus is on congratulating them, supporting them, encouraging them, and that includes a little bit of joking around with them, uh, especially the guys that like Tom Brady. Um, <laughs> so we, um, you know, so I've got, I've got this team from out of state and I'm calling these guys, the rest of the guys up after this happened. Um, and they are, um, they're not interacting, they're, they're like deadpan, they're depressed, they're, you can tell. It had a huge impact uh, on these guys. And that's not a bad thing. Because for, to see somebody to begin to develop some empathy, um, I think that's a good, big step toward learning how to treat an intimate partner. Um, it continues to be complicated. There, you know, we, we are we change our program every time. We think uh, we have a different idea that'll work better. Um, so it's it's always in sort of in a state of flux. Um, but it's it's a it's a challenging area, and I and I can't say enough for the people on the team who just the way it works uh, is that we staff everybody coming into court before court. So at one thirty we have staffing. And everybody comes in, we talk about how the person's doing, if there are any issues, did he have any hot UAs, um, any other issues, you know, any of those kinds of problems. Um, you know, how do we deal with that problem, this problem or that problem? Um, and, and all these people give their time to do that. It's, 
it's just amazing to have the level of perspective we have. You know, we, we have Shell who's, who's got the defense side, um, we have law enforcement, or is there, um, he's also the guy that when somebody drops out of sight, stops coming to court, he goes out and finds them, brings them back. Um, Courtney is there as an advocate. She is also, by the way, a confidential advocate, which means that she can only share what the victim gives her permission to share. And I can tell you that is a huge, hugely important part uh, because victims need someone they can talk to where it's not going to all get just talked about in court and out there. Um, they need a comfort level. Um, and, and, and she provides that. Uh, and we have a treatment provider, we have a prosecutor, um, we have somebody from CASA, uh, which is the Child um, Visitation Exchange Program. So we try to cover as many bases as we can. Um, as I said, we're still sort of feeling our way along, I think. Um, I continue to be just amazed at how complex and complicated these cases can be. Um, we certainly see the kind of stuff that you see on that power control wheel. Um, but a lot of times it's, it's, it's kind of cleverly disguised as as blame. Um, it's, uh, it, it's not so overt as to say you have to do A, B, and C or I'm going to hit you. Um, it, it's the psychological manipulation stuff. Um, the, the, the message comes across is that if you would do better, uh, if you would do differently, then I wouldn't have to do what I do. Um, so it, it's always a challenge. Uh, um, you know, you guys, uh, if you haven't seen it, I can tell you in, in, this, in this room right here, you've got a, large, a fairly large number of people who have been a victim. Uh, they may not say that, but it's true. I, when I do jury selection, I always, I, if, if I have 18 people sitting waiting to be selected for a jury panel, I can, I can pretty much guarantee three or four uh, will, will be disclosing past history of abuse. I think the thing that makes it difficult for officers and for all of us is this, really this collision of emotion. Um, and I thought a lot about this as a prosecutor and tried to explain this to juries when I was doing trials. There's three emotions at play, key emotions at play here. Love, hope, and fear. And as Courtney said, these, these cases don't start out abusive. I never had a victim come in when I was a prosecutor and say, yeah, he asked me out, he came to the front door, I opened the door, he hit me in the nose, um, said, now that we got that out of the way, let's go have dinner. Um, it's not the way it happens. Um, they're, they're, um, they're very charming. And it, and it goes from something like, look, I know, you know you've been working all day and I know you don't, you know, I, I hate to see you have to drive to the grocery store by yourself. Let me take you to the grocery store. That's the way it is for a while. Let me take it. I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Uh, I really like you. Um, slowly, it changes to um, you don't go to the grocery store unless I take you. It's a subtle change, but it happens. And then it goes into things like, and when you're at the grocery store, you don't look at any other man in the eye. Um, uh, it, and it, those kinds of it, it begins to morph that way. <laughs> and that's a hard thing for somebody on a day-to-day -day basis to kind of point their finger or put their finger on and say, that's when things changed and got weird. Um, so it, it is, that's, but that's the love part. Um, and it's not bad every day. You know, there's a lot of people who think domestic violence should get beat up every day. Why doesn't she leave? That's always the question. By the way, there's a, there's a wonderful, um, uh, statement made by one of the victims of the guy from the White House who's been kicked out. And it's called And So I Stay. You should read it. It is probably the most succinct, powerful statement I've heard from a victim in a very long time. And I'm sure you can Google it and find it. Um, so that's, that's the love part. And it's not, and some days are good, some days are bad. And that feeds into the hope. The hope that the good days will get better again, the good days will, there will be more good days than bad days, and eventually the good days will take over and it will be good, like it was at the beginning. That's the hope. Um, and every day that's a good day feeds into that hope. Um, love and hope are very positive emotions. 
then you overlay fear. Because when the violence happens, it is not one day of violence and then it's over. It's, uh, I was trying to think of some kind of high-tech analogy to use here, and I keep going back to my old days of recording music. And you guys know what VU meters are? They're the little things that jump up and back and forth when the sound is on. And, and some of those VU meters, it's like if you yell into a microphone and the VU meter jumps up here, there's a little mark that stays there, and then the needle goes back down. And at any time that the needle goes above that mark, it moves the mark up higher. The first act of violence sets the mark. The person may never get physically hurt again, but they know that that person is capable of reaching that mark. I had a, a case years ago where the guy was they were on their honeymoon, um, they were at the, wherever it was, they were at, the, at their honeymoon and got in an argument. Um, and the guy kept getting madder and madder and madder and finally he like <coughs> slammed his hand, hand on the table, reached over, hit her and broke her nose. And so we're talking to her and saying, so give us the history here, what happened? You know, when was, how many times did he abuse you? She goes, he never touched me again. What do you think he did? They get in an argument? We're in court trying this case. Now remember the defendant sitting behind me. Um, we're in court trying this case as she is on the stand. She's doing a pretty good job. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, not because of any specific question, she just falls apart. She, she, we have to take a break. She literally cannot keep going. And I have a victim advocate in the room with her. And so, you know, the jury is taken out of the room and I, the judge takes a recess and I'm going back and saying, what is going on? Um, he was sitting at the table, defense table, caught her eye, watched her eye, and then went. That's all it took. That's how subtle and complicated and challenging this area is because you were dealing with people who know how to communicate with each other. You know, it's easy to try a case where somebody sits by a drunk driver. They're mad, they're a, an innocent victim. They didn't ask for that, they didn't put themselves in a position. All that stuff that you hear that becomes blamed for victims. Those people will come to court, they're motivated to come to court. Um, and they don't know that person. Uh, you know, I have cases where I actually have to have the, the victim or the defendant talk for a while in order for the, the, the victims to hear the defendant and hear that this person really is remorseful about what happened. Um, in a domestic violence case, these people communicate all the time on levels that are nonverbal, um, and it just creates this huge challenge. So you, you combine love, hope, and fear, and you can see the kind of complexity you're gonna deal with. Any one of those might be at the top at any given time, but it is a, a challenging, fascinating, scary area. Um, I lost two victims, uh, had two victims killed when I was a prosecutor, and there's nothing worse than talking to a woman on Friday afternoon. She's saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to go to my mom's house, I'm safe, and hearing her name on the news on Sunday. Um, you never quite get over that. Um, it is dangerous, and it's serious, and it, it, we just continue to look for ways to, to address it. Judge, can you uh, talk a little bit about the change in the law? How we've had some changes, um, probably at least in the last 10 years, if not more recently, in the last two, on the mandatory restraining orders. Um, yeah. Um, you know, and how you have to be held without bond until you see a judge. Some right. of those things. We, um, years ago, our, our, and actually that brings a really good point because I want to I address something that Courtney had mentioned, uh, and it has to do with the female arrest rate. Our, our domestic violence laws, the core of our domestic violence laws were passed in the early 90s, from 93 to 95, I think. Um, they are some of the broadest, they are, it's one of the broadest definitions of domestic violence in the country. And I, when I left the DA's office, before I got appointed to the bench, I was consulting around the country, so I got to get to know a lot of other uh, states and how they handle things. Um, we have one of the broadest definitions in the country. Uh, basically what it says is that there is, um, domestic violence is defined as any act of violence 
which drives me nuts as an English teacher that you never use the word you're trying to define in the definition of the word. Um, any act of violence, threatened act of violence, or any other act, any other crime, when it's used for the purposes of retaliation, control, revenge, intimidation. So you can have a domestic, we have a, sort of what we refer to as a domestic violence tag. It can go on any crime. I have charged cases when I was a prosecutor, I charged cases reckless driving domestic violence because the guy's trying to run her off the road. Um, and so any act, if you put it in the context of intimate partner, can be domestic violence. Um, that is one of the reasons we see a high female arrest rate because the definition, the, the officers have to apply the definition of the law. They don't get to make up their own law and they have a probable cause standard and they will see cases where even though the person going to jail is the female and there may be a lot of reasons why whatever happened happened, it still fits the definition. Um, I, I remember a victim who got mad at her abuser when he headed off to the bar because that was never a big sign and she put her foot through his like $800 speaker. Um, he got home, he was pretty drunk, looked at her and said, now it's your turn. And he called the police. She was arrested for damaging his property. Um, and it was, and she did it, she was, she said, I, you know, I was mad at him. So it was retaliation. Um, we also know that his history was much more complicated and much more thorough, uh, much more um, involved than hers. Um, but, so that's the law that we started with. Um, it, it, we also have developed mandatory DB classes that people have to go to. Uh, there's three different levels. You have to go through an evaluation and then you have to do DB classes. They're groups. They're like men's groups. We have women's groups. Uh, we also have same-sex groups um, uh, to deal with some of these dynamics that Courtney was talking about. Um, we, um, it, it, the law has changed as, as we figured out stuff. We used to have a... Um, Damage to property was one of those things where if you were damaging your own door in your own house, it wasn't a crime. Um, and then we had a goalie from the uh, Avalanche years ago named Patrick Law, who I guess had a bad game, and came home and started putting his fists through all the doors. And somebody realized, wait a minute, they're not just his doors, they're her doors too. Um, so we changed the law to say uh, that that includes marital property. Um, and then more recently, we, uh, there is a mandatory protection order that goes into effect in every criminal case, but in domestic violence, sex assault, stalking cases, um, it is much more thorough. The, the standard right now that we use is the same one that's used pretty much across the state, <laughs> which as, as Sergeant said, um, if there's a mandatory arrest, so if there's a probable cause this person's arrested, goes to jail. They will still stay in jail until they see a judge. They cannot postpone until they see a judge. So they're going to spend at least one night in jail, and over the weekend it's three. Um, they come to court, they're advised, they are at that time given a mandatory protection order. The main part of the protection order is that you can't harass, retaliate, tamper with that victim. In other words, you can't go back and, you know, mess with the victim. Um, there's also, uh, a couple of years ago, we added a, a gun relinquishment section because I think, Chilly, you mentioned the, stat, the, uh, stat, the statistic on weapons and how that increases lethality. So if a person has weapons, they have to relinquish those during the pendency of the case. This is before they're ever even convicted. Um, this is just because they've been charged. <coughs> they're given a bond at that first appearance and they are, uh, the mandatory protection order is imposed. And that mandatory protection order says you cannot, uh, you're to have no contact with the victim. You're to um, vacate the home and stay away from the home. You're also to stay away from any other location where that victim might be. Basically, the law says you cannot have any contact with that person until the judge says, until there's a, 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 a a modification of that order so Now I will say that when we started doing that about a year ago, um, we also see a lot of victims coming in at the next appearance asking that I vacate or change that order to allow for contact. But what it does is it gives me the chance to look at the PC affidavit written by the officers to see what the level of lethality is 
certain things are more lethal than others. Strangulation is, is right at the top. Um, by the way, let me just segue for a moment. You all, guys all know, you've all seen strangulation, right? What causes a person to lose consciousness when they're strangled? Cut off what? Yeah, it's oxygen, right? It's not air. Uh, it may feel like their air is being cut off. But actually, to close off the trachea, to close off this part of the neck, is, it takes a lot of pressure. And you almost have to crush that part, since it's all cartilage right here. You almost have to crush that to close that off. What strangulation does is it goes here, and it, it's the, um, um, well, the carotids are, are take the, um, it's the, what is it, carotids? Anyway, it's a vein. The vein, the part that, that takes, the, that drains the blood out of your brain is on the outside of your neck. The, the artery that takes the blood into your brain is on the inside of your neck. When you squeeze someone's neck, what you're doing is you're stopping the drain. The, the heart still pumps. The, the pressure, blood still goes into your brain. Pressure builds and builds and builds, but no oxygen because you can't get the circulation. It's the deprivation of oxygen that actually causes you to pass out. Um, and the pressure is what causes what we call petechia, all those little red spots. Those are all little blood vessels that are burst because they're so full of pressure. And if you can imagine, if you can see petechia on someone's eyes, imagine what their brain looks like. Um, so it's a huge amount of damage. It takes about eight to 10 seconds of that. And, and it takes about the same amount. If you think of going to a store and looking for a good cantaloupe, that's about how much pressure it takes to cut off those two veins. Um, that's a high lethal kind of, of, a, of a case. And think about how personal that is. You are face to face with this, I mean, you could be behind them, but you are hands on. You have your hands around this person's neck. You were for the most part, you're probably looking at this person in the eye. And what are you doing symbolically? You are cutting off that person's ability to speak. That person has no right to speak or to talk or to express themselves. Um, that arrest number is on the rise. Yes, going up. Um, and those are the very, very dangerous cases. Uh, but they're, uh, but again, you have, you know, even in those situations, you have victims who are looking out for themselves. I, I, I'll just finish with this. When I was a prosecutor, my goal was this. My goal was to have the system available to any victim that needed it. I would take the case as far as the victim wanted me to take it. If the victim was felt comfortable coming to court, or if I had other ways to prove the case without the victim being there, I would move forward with the case. Um, moving forward, a lot of times means some sort of a plea bargain too, not necessarily trial. Um, if that victim at any point said, I'm done, I, I'm not gonna participate anymore, my goal was to say, that's your choice. Who am I to say that that's the wrong choice? I don't live in this person's shoes, I don't know what this person's dealing with, but what I wanted that person to know is that anytime you feel at risk, anytime that you feel you need the system, the system will be there um, to respond for you. And if you, if you have to come in and ask for six protection orders and then not follow through with them and, because that's what's comfortable for you, that's fine. <coughs> that's what I think the system needs to do is be available, um, not force people to go forward, but be available when any, whenever a person feels ready uh, to go forward. And the other thing, and I, I think Sergeant will talk about a little, uh, agree with this, that we, we can constantly look for other ways to be, the, the DA's office, the law enforcement side, the executive branch, which is law enforcement and prosecutors, are always looking for other ways to be able to put, take a case forward without having to even have called the victim to the stand. Um, but a lot of times that means, you know, that's not possible because we have a constitution that says you have the right to confront your accusers. Um, and that creates a lot of problems. So it's a, it's a challenge. Let's do questions. One, yeah, one thing. Go ahead. Sure. Um, I would just say that a lot of a lot of times that um, victims call the police not to initiate a criminal case. They call the police to stop that incident to get through that night, and they don't want the offender to be taken and to be charged. 
there's so many times when they um, automatically just stop and say, I don't want to do this. I'm not, I don't want to go through with this the next day. So that's something to take into consideration is recantation can start that following day, that same night, they may not ever tell a person until they finally get to that, I'm done, and now I'm ready to be a bitch. You know, that's what, that's what a lot of times they get to, or they come to confidential services like Tessa, and they can interact with an advocate, find safe housing, and start rebuilding their lives. So that's something that I just wanted to make sure that a lot of people don't really understand that victims call the police to stop an incident, not necessarily to get someone arrested or to initiate a criminal case. Questions? This is for the sergeant, but how has the number of homicides been uh, affected because of the mandatory policies brought up by this court? Um, the number of arrests, can't, can't speak specifically to the number of arrests that are domestic related. I think it's typically 25%, but how the laws have changed and really haven't changed that at all time and time again. That, that piece of it, that the homicide piece of it from a relationship standpoint is always going to be big. The potential is always there. Hi, this is another question for the sergeant. Um, so you said that there was a three day uh, arrest and they go to jail if there's enough uh, to convict them when the police arrive. Do you believe that the three days in jail is an adequate deterrent for a lot of these abusers, or does it escalate if they're called more often? I do. I think that it's a real good deterrent, because I'll be honest with you, lots of really good people, law-abiding citizens, in a heated financial argument with a loved one about whatever, you went and bought shoes and we don't have that money. You went and did this, and we don't have that money, and I'm mad. And the smallest of thing happens, good people with good jobs, that in an instant make a poor decision, and it happens on a Friday night. You wind up spending three days in jail with dudes that you wouldn't want to hang out with. And, and that oftentimes is enough for people to go, okay, not going to do that again. Most most people are good folks. I mean, just love. And I'll be honest with you, it's, it's why heat of passion. If you're convicted of a crime, there's a heat of passion. Your sentence is substantially less because there's love involved. The courts understand that. That's why you'll spend less time in jail if there's that heat of passion with regards to that. So, But yeah, I think that it's a big time deterrent. And I think for a lot of people, they see and understand, wow. My civil liberties have now just been attacked and I'm in jail. I could lose my job. I've been arrested for domestic violence. I could never sit in this classroom. She can't get into this university with that conviction. You know, post 9-11, you know, the game has changed. We want to know who's sitting next to us where we work or where we go to school. You know, that, that the people knowing that that conviction <laughs> Change the complexity. You can't work at McDonald's with a domestic violence uh, arrest in some instances. Some jobs they won't touch you, and people know and they they they're, they make that aware of to them. So that's why people fight so hard uh, when there's a claim where they haven't done something to get off, and and that's good too because we we, we want to get it right. We want to make sure that we have the evidence. We, like I said, we don't want to make that arrest. We really don't. We just want to try to get it right. But yeah, unfortunately, good people make bad decisions and it only takes an instant. And if I could follow up on that a little bit, I, um, and again, this goes to how complex and layered this sort of thing is, that the same act can be an act of control, battering, um, domination, or it, it can be a, re a response to a specific situation. Um, 
you know, I and I, I, I give examples. I've already mentioned the one of the woman who put her foot through the guy's speaker. That is a criminal act. But that's not a that's not a, uh, a an attempt to dominate someone. That's just a reaction, an inappropriate reaction, an illegal reaction, and and should be there should be some level of accountability. But I would maintain that person should not be labeled a domestic violence offender. Um, I had a case where a couple lost a young daughter. She collapsed on a playground and died of a heart heart ailment that nobody knew about. And these people were racked with grief. Um, and they got would get into arguments about going to counseling. And he was kind of doing the whole macho guy thing and saying, you know, it's over. We can't do anything about it. Let's just move on. And, and they grew, they grew further and further apart. They got into an argument and. She was kind of trying to plead with him to, to sit down and talk about it, and he grabbed her, pushed her out of the way, and stormed out of the house. And he grabbed her hard enough to leave bruises. Um, that's an assault. But we talked, in that case, we talked to family, we talked to neighbors, we talked to everybody we could find, and no one had any indication or had any um, examples of him ever being abusive before. This was grief, and in my view, what the system should have done was to say, you need to go to grief counseling. Um, so that you can, uh, and and she agreed. She said, you know, we either either we go to some sort of counseling, or we're going to lose our relationship along with our daughter. Um, so those kinds of things. We see a lot of cases, and and or spoke to this, where victims are are kind of they're responding to what what I call precursor behavior. It's that behavior. They, they know each other, and and this victim knows that it's coming. Sometimes they'll actually push it forward to get it over with. And, and, and get it behind them. And, the, and, and I've talked with a lot of victims, they say, if I, if I trigger it early enough, it's not as bad. If I let the pressure build and build and build, then the abuse gets worse. Um, when, the, when, the, when it finally flashes and the abuse happens, it's much worse <coughs> because it's been building up. Um, so you, we see a lot of females who um, are responding to that kind of precursor behavior. They know it. They know intuitively what's going on, um, but it may not rise to the level of a self-defense under what the law defines as self-defense. This is why there's not always this direct um, you know, line between what the law says is a crime and what the actual dynamic of what's going on in the, in the incident. Um, my experience is the guys, you know, the, the things where it's a, it's a result of a situation, grief, argument over gambling or something. Um, uh, those guys, uh, women who are charged with what we sort of re refer to as responsive or reactive violence, <coughs> that three days in jail tends to be pretty effective. <coughs> the true batterers, the guys that, that are using violence to control, manipulate, dominate, um, that's probably not going to have that much of a, of a difference. Um, it has to be something deeper or longer term more consequences. Um, so every situation is different. Um, that's that's what makes it such a challenge. Other questions? Uh, sorry, Morgan. You mentioned, or maybe I, I heard this wrong, but you mentioned that 25% of the goals of the victims are females. Is that correct? 25% is the arrest number. Arrest number? Total arrest number. What is the percentage of actually males being victims? Um, well, I guess. Does that happen often? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I mean, you have to take out, if it were a same-sex situation or something like that, that's just sort of a, a vague number. But uh, typically, you're always going to find, like I said, males are predominantly the ones that are doing you know, th this crime. Seventy-five percent of these cases are done by males. The national stats say that um, males are victims one in four and females are one in three. Um, most female offenders don't perpetrate the same way that male offenders do. So they have a different type of <coughs> abuse style whenever it comes to that power and control because there's already inherent power dynamics from their relationship because men and women aren't equal currently. So their abuse typically <coughs> tends to be more emotional abuse and 
drives down that self-esteem the same way that um, a male perpetrator will, but they don't do the same sort of intimidation tactics. It just looks very different. So those look very different. Yeah, a men are for the most part stronger in upper body, so taking on a man physically that way doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I think my experience is what you see a lot of um, in in those female and there are there are female patterns, but they're pretty awfully rare. I mean, I can't think of I can't count on two hands how many I had over twenty three years. Um, but when they do, their abuse tends to be more uh, property damage. That sort of stuff, taking someone on physically is, is uh, probably not a good idea for the most part. Um, so you'll see more of that kind of stuff. The other thing I'll tell you is that um, for women who are, are uh, charged with domestic violence, um, the use of weapons is quite is, is higher than in men. I think that's an equalizer. I think that's what, you know, it's, uh, I, to me that's sort of a red flag to look for self-defense. <coughs> but. So there, there's a, those other kind of dynamics. It's very, very different in the way it looks. Uh, good question. Um, how effective are uh, re like restraining orders, or how often are they broken? I guess. I, I guess either way, are they effective? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. yep. It's a piece of paper. A lot. We arrest. That was almost every night. Out of the 41 calls that we get on average a night, a pretty good percentage of those are violations of restraining orders. A phone call, a text, an email, third party contacts. Someone gets a brother or cousin, uncle, sister to call the victim. That's against the law. You can't do that. You can't have a third party contact a person that you victimized. That's against the law because that's another way of sending a message, I can get you. I can get to you. I can give messages to you. Especially with the change in the law, Matt, that now it's a mandatory restraining order at the time of your first appearance, then at that time, it, it's it's an official piece of paper, and any contact is a, both a violation of your bond conditions as well as a new case, and you see those cases filed like crazy. And that increased um, probably threefold, is that about right? Yeah. And, and that changes for us because that order is the order of a judge. And then that's something that we just, we're not going to put games on that. If it's there and if it's a violation, we're going to make that arrest every time. And I see it as the abuser pushing. They want to see if they can get back in and see how far they can push the victim again. So they're going to start with small text messages, then they're going to grow into more in-person contact. You know, it's domestic violence is a lot of boundary pushing, and that's how you initiate things with, and that's how offenders initiate things. So that's something that we kind of see. And then it's really up to the victim to enforce that. So if they aren't calling the police at that first text message, then they're going to go to another step. Then they're going to move to another step. And now the protection order is useless. What it does do is it, having a piece of paper isn't going to protect anybody. What it does do is it gives law enforcement one more tool, one more basis upon which to act. So it, it's a responsive thing. It's not, I mean, we, we like to think protection orders are, are pre preventative. Um, but really, they are simply a, a, it creates a, a, an avenue for law enforcement to respond um, and make an arrest. And violation protection orders are also mandatory arrest. Uh, so that person ends up back uh, in jail again. Um, but it's not going to protect anybody. And I stopped telling victims a long time ago that the system won't protect you because the system can't be with you 24 um, 7. And that's why Tesla has this wonderful, they do safety planning with people, they, you know, they go through with scenarios, if this happens, what do you do? It's, um, and, and that stuff is important because ultimately, victims are gonna have to protect themselves, at least until law enforcement can get there. I'm just curious, what is the percentage of the abuser going through these programs? 
far. Do you need to determine what is the percentage of the abuser that's going through the program that has been provided to them? What is the percentage of the abuser putting their life around, basically? Um, well, we, the last, last time we checked, we were 50% who were, had graduated the program and had not reoffended. Um, I can tell you that uh, for the people that don't succeed in the program, which means they typically end up in jail or prison, um, their uh, reoffense rate is going to be much higher. The guys that get through the program graduate successfully. Um, and it is, it is fun. It, it's interesting to watch these guys because these are some pretty hardcore guys. And but boy, they want that certificate. <laughs> for, for a lot of guys, this is the only thing they've ever been successful at. Right. Yeah. I mean, when, when we figured out how big the certificate was, um, and we started talking about it, the first thing we had to do was figure out, where do we put on the certificate? <laughs> you, you really put the certificate in your house that says, I graduated from domestic violence court. <laughs> you know, it's not the sort of thing you're, you're going to put up. So we, we tweaked the language and talked about problem solving courts and, you know, focused again on their success. The guys that do succeed, one of our first graduates was a hardcore gangster, gang guy. Um, he had a long history in, in, of gang involvement, um, got through the program, got, and he was the first guy to graduate. He actually came back and helped some of the groups. And we, we encouraged these guys to come back and do mentoring, uh, because sort of on that AA model or NA model, um, you know, you've been through it, so, you know, it's hard to bullshit a bullshit or so. Come back in and, and tell these guys because you're speaking their language. But I can tell you, most of these guys don't want to do that. When they get to the point to where they believe that they have moved past this, they have new strategies, they have new ways of dealing with it, their relationships have improved, or at least they're not getting arrested all the time, um, they don't really want to come back and hang out. Um, they sort of want to move on. So it's, it's tough to get these guys to to come back and, and engage. The guys that do well um, get through, so like I said, about half. And we, we, I won't say we never see them reoffend. We do see some reoffend, but it's a very, very small percentage compared with those that don't go through the program or those that don't succeed in the program. Yeah. So. We're looking for a specific population. So, and I had a guy, I said, you're going to be challenged. You're going to, you're going to have to deal with your peer group and figure 
I have language that, and it's from the guy who says, got it covered, Judge. Yeah, really? Tell me how you got it covered. He said, um, I changed my words to a message. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suffering. Okay, what did you words to that message say? He said, we changed it, and now it says, uh, how do you reach the home of the residents? We don't know right now, leave a message. We're making some changes in the life, and if we don't find you back, you'll remember them. <laughs> Thank you. 